Okay, I spent some time trying to find out if there was any particular missionary or set of missions that would account for this 21 that is ending at the equivalent of R646 AD and I'm not finding anybody. There were a lot of missionaries. You know, you got Columba, Columban, you, those were at, coming after St. Patrick. You have a guy named Aidan who was also as a result of Columba. But they were all really goofy people. And there's goofy stuff written about them, including goofy stuff about St. Patrick. So, you also had somebody um, coming along a little bit later named Boniface who was supposedly an apostle of the Germans and not all of this is actually happening by 646 some of it's a little bit later but the point is is that this devastating 126 condemnation of mainstream Christianity doesn't seem to have any kind of um, counter proof okay in other words it's, it's a well deserved number that Christianity, even with the missionaries, was largely in the toilet during this time. But, apparently between, because this is the equivalent of 625, between 625 and 646, there was some growth. Trouble is, I can't link it to any particular missionary. The only thing I can say about it is that around here, starting in 525, a goofy guy named Benedict started up a bunch of monastic um, missions. And if they're monastic missions and they're copying Bible, it's understandable that at least some individuals, see, because you, have any, you don't have any orange here. So any growth is going to have to be individuals. The, any individual growth is going to be limited. And it would be limited to the monks. I mean, the heroic story that um, Luke seems to be telling, because it's particularly pronounced, going here, here, because that's a really good num number, and then especially here, okay, these are groups and good totals, good report cards. The story that Luke seems to be telling, if I'm interpreting the numbers correctly, as a timeline of the teachers. In here, what would account for this 21 by 646, from 625 to 646, it would be because, you know, when our boy um, Jerome did his new translation, some of the people who got it ran with it. Okay? Mainstream, no. But some individuals, yes. And then by the time you have the start of the Benedictine monasteries here, even though Benedict himself and the monastery rule of Benedict was goofball, if they were copying scripture, they would have been learning scripture and they'd have grown out of their goofballness. I was a goofball Christian. I used to think that pointing your finger into some section of the Bible with your eyes closed would help you know the will of God. That's how bad I was. When I was 18. Okay, that was before I got under my teacher. It was, you know, the year that I learned of him. I was still like that just before I learned of him. Okay. And once I started to learn of him and once I started to get his classes, that's how I learned Hebrew and Greek. Because that's how he taught it, was from the Hebrew and Greek. And I learned him in vocabulary form, but it wasn't all that hard. And then once and some years later, I got a hold of the actual text, and I learned how to read the Greek letters, and I'd already had a familiarity with the sound. And the same thing with the Hebrew. It wasn't that hard to learn. It took me like 18 months, because I already heard so much of it before. Okay, well, maybe that's what happened with these guys. Individual monks, they're copying, and of course, you know, you don't have to know the language to copy it. You're just copying the shapes of the letters. But maybe that's how they learn to read. Okay? 
and that you know because in the scriptoriums that was their that was a source of income to them was to copy bibles okay so you could learn to read as a result of learning to copy and then as you learn to read you learn to understand and as you learn to understand you start to put two and two together and you're copying the bible so many times it sticks plus they used to read sections of the bible they had what they called a liturgy where they go through the Bible, it was kind of a lot like the, the the ancient and still today modern Hebrew method of going through the Bible in a year or two. The, the Hebrew word for it's parashat, and it really means paragraphs. And you'd have a section that you'd always read at the same time every year, and that's what their liturgy was. Is they'd have sections of scripture that you read, you know, at, at length, and it was always the same one every length. And then sometimes you'd mix it with other paragraphs. That's the Hebraic style too. And maybe that's what happened is they'd read it at meals. They'd read it at their services. And so individuals grew. And when you have enough of that going on, here 126 years worth, yeah, technically speaking, the mainstream is in the trash. But you're going to have individual growth. And when you have enough individuals growing and they talk to people and they talk to people and so on, you're going to have a group. And that's 21. This is like basic growth. 21 is a basic growth number. The number of years that, that um, what's his face? Jacob was in slavery. I mean, you know, slavery was really indenture would be a better word for it. But slavery is the word the Bible uses to mean indenture. But he voluntarily enslaved himself to Laban to work off, you know, the marriage contract. Okay. So, that's basic. Enslaving yourself until you work out your your debt. Okay? So, they were growing then. Doesn't mean that they were right in their doctrines. But by 646 AD, there was a group. And you can see how there would be. Because if we start up here, okay, we're starting up here. When Jerome's translation comes out and it cycles and circulates and circulates and circulates and we saw how it might have done it through uh, Patrick which was uh, 432 to 461 okay then you know by 200 years later when our boy Jerome's translation is old enough to be respected because now the language is too old well, then maybe it started going into more circulation, but there had already been people using it. So then they kept up the meaning as the Latin changed. They kept up the meaning and could talk about it properly. Okay, but I can't find a particular missionary or a particular monastery. Right At this point, the Benedictine monasteries had really started to multiply. Okay, but it might not be them. It might be one monastery. It might have been in Ireland. It might have been in England, because England had been evangelized by this point. England and Ireland were sending out their own missionaries to Europe at this point. Okay? So maybe it was there. Maybe it was England. Maybe it was Ireland. Maybe it was France where the Benedictines were. But here's the one thing you can say for sure. Scripture was being disseminated, and at this point, Jerome's um, translation was beginning to be accepted, okay? It was beginning to be accepted by the mainstream. So then that kind of can account for the 21, but I can't say in particular who it might be, okay? And is it a time of anger in, in um, the world? You bet. This is when, the, the, this is when the, all the little tribes... You know, from, uh, who's he, what's this, from Clovis, the kid. He had he had several kids. He divided up his kingdom. And under the Salian law, um, the way the kingdoms worked is that each of the sons got some, and then they started fighting with each other to see who would, you know, rule over who. It was kind of like Constantine all over again. It wasn't supposed to be that way. But it did get that way. There was a whole lot of orge, see, orge, anger, amongst the people, okay? A whole lot of that going on. There's a whole lot of fighting, quite a lot, okay? 
So between the fighting and the monasteries and having copies of Bible that you could, that at least some people, since it came out in 405, could understand and teach. Okay, there was also a certain degree, but not a whole lot. There was a certain degree to which some of the monasteries were saying, you know what, let's go find the original Hebrew. Let's go find the Greek and start making our copies, you know, accordingly. And that was going on because we, we do have Greek manuscripts from this period. A lot of our Greek manuscripts are from the 5th, which is 400s, and 6th, which is the 500s century. Okay. So by 646, you got a, a pretty good amount of, of scriptural backup in the original Greek and Hebrew, as well as in the Latin. The Latin, by far, is the most numerous. But then that means that people are talking about it, they're learning it. Okay, so then there would be a 21, a sort of basic growth in groups. But notice, it goes back down again, here and here and here. And yet, that's why I said this in the prior increments, you got only individuals here and yet it's a 91, which is stressing the role of the individual. All right? And this would be 737 AD. I, we don't know who the individuals are, okay? But they obviously came forth from this group. You got a group growth and then it goes back to individuals again and yet it's a 91 by that point. And of course, the 91 includes, well, actually it doesn't. The 91 is a result of this growth in between of the individuals. So those individuals who grew during this time, and this is just before Charlemagne is going to, you know, he, I think he's basically born here. Um, it's before the advent of Charlemagne. So these individuals really matter, but we have no idea who they are. Okay? Now, when you come farther along, from 707 forward, unfortunately I can't show here the whole line. Then we got another group growth here, ending at 779. Okay? And that's definitely just before Charlemagne. That would be in the reign of, of Pippin the Short, his dad. And they were, that was the move, moving over the, uh, you know, upending of the, of the Merovingians and the replacement by the Carolingians through Pippin the Short and really through his dad, Charles Martel. And 732 was the Battle of Tours, and that's why this is significant. And Battle of Tours would be five syllables prior before Salon, Salu, Kai, that's three. Talasis, yeah, I've covered that before. Talasis. Talasis. The C, politics. Bible always uses the C to mean politics or polities. And so that was when Martel won. And, and after Martel won, they were much more influential as mayors of the palace in the remaining Carolingian dynasty. But the Carolingians who were in, po who were in power were weak, weak. I mean, truly weak. And so this is about the deposition under Childeric III when Pepin the Short takes power. Okay, but one of the things they do when they take power is they're, they're real big on scripture. And of course, um, in 768, because this is 779, this is the year that, that um, Charlemagne actually begins to be a king. In 779, he had already been king for like 11 years because he comes to power in 668, which is about here. Okay, some say seven, I mean, 770, 768, some say 771, so it may be about here. Okay, so but he isn't crowned as a holy Roman emperor until like about 10 syllables back of this because the 780 equals 820. Eight, 10 and in 800 he was crowned by um, the Pope who wanted to make sure that he could retain some kind of control um, but the thing about Charlemagne was is that he really wanted everybody to learn scripture and so monasteries flourished like crazy 
during and after his reign. Even though after his reign it things didn't go so well because it ended up splitting up. But but the monasteries and the, the first they were called the Clunies and then they were called the Cistercians. They go gangbusters. There are so hundreds. Hundreds of monasteries grow during just after Charlemagne and onward, and that's resulting in this growth. We got group growth here, good group growth. Okay, and one of the foci of the Cluny and the Cistercian monasteries was let's find and compare the original scripture in Hebrew and Greek to the text we got, and let's make sure we have the right text. That was one of their main foci, okay? So that would account for this going on, and that would also account for why it looks like the Lucan timeline is about the teachers, because this is the singular feature of this time from 1038 forward, is, is the 1100s um, A.D. was known as a period when the Cistercians in particular we're trying to get accurate copies of manuscripts um, in Greek and in Hebrew so that they could fix the Latin and they could make better translations and make better copies and they were making a lot of Greek and Hebrew um, Old and New Testaments particularly Greek because you know they would take the Hebrew and they translate it into Greek um, or they would take a hold of the you know the Greek Old Testament that they had from the Jews which is really what the Jews had translated and then they would be copying that so there's a whole bunch of that going on here focus on the text and therefore if you got the focus on the text you got focus on teaching the text and if it's the focus on teaching the text it's it's being nice to but at the same time sort of ignoring the papacy in Rome and that was one of the other features of the Cistercians and the Clunies before them was that they wanted to reform the whole system they they were really pretty much against the papacy but they they weren't trying to actually rebel so much as they were just trying to be separate so that could account for why Luke's timeline is what it is it's tracing the teaching okay now, that's my argument for it. If you got a better one, let me know.